Are we live? Uh, we will be. Dump, 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 diddle, dump. Dun, diddle, dun. I feel like we're live. I f I'm feeling it in my bones. Do you, you feel it? I feel it in my bones. Uh, it said for Twitch, it says sending data, but that's what it says. All right, let's do it. <clears throat> hey, everybody. My name is Indy, and the gentleman's right next to me, right over here, right there. That's, uh, oh, wow, the, th the things got messed up. Um, that is Mr. J. Powell. And uh, over there on the end, we have Alex. I got to fix those names. I thought I fixed them. And uh, Alex is from Pixel Nuts. <laughs> Let me do that over. What's up, everybody? My name's Indy, and this gentleman next to me is Jay Powell. And this is Indie Game Business. What's up? Today, we are talking with Alex from Pixel Knot Games about Lost Orbit. Hi, Alex. Hello, I <laughs> I had to mute us. <laughs> you got a what? I had to mute us because the mixer doesn't. I watch it. I watch the mixer stream, and it doesn't automatically mute us when we go live. And so, I get this weird little reverb thing. So sorry. Yeah, that was it. That's what yes. the problem. It was. It was you. That was what the problem was. You did it. Well, welcome to the show, Alex. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, guys. So, you know, we always like to start with, with the first question is, tell us how you originally got into the industry, and then from there, walk us through your career so far. Okay, sounds good, yeah. So, um, I'm from uh, Ontario, Canada, uh, and um, probably about in uh, 2005, I got my first job at Silicon Knights in the games industry. Um, and uh, if uh, anyone's not familiar with Silicon Knights, they made uh, Eternal Darkness and Two Human. Um, when I started, they were just um, in the early stages of Two Human. So that's kind of where I started my career. Uh, I was lucky enough to get a job pretty much right out of school um, for a company that I really wanted to work for. So um, that was pretty great. Uh, I was an environment artist to start. Um, so I got a job in Human making props and assets. Uh, eventually, through the years, I became uh, a lead there uh, for the environment art team um, and then ended up leaving during the X-Men Destiny um, game. And uh, at that point, I kind of didn't really know what I wanted to do specifically. So I was either going to go get another job. Um, Ubisoft Toronto had just opened up locally here. Um, and uh, I was thinking about maybe doing that, but then uh, a friend of mine uh, wanted to start an indie games company with me as well. So we ended up pursuing that, and then we started um, Pixel Knots um, right after that. That was in 2010. So I worked at Silicon Knights for about five years before doing that. Um, I don't think you guys have any questions about Silicon Knights time, or if you want just to kind of continue with kind of where Pixel Knots went after that. I'm familiar with, with, with Silicon Knights. I don't know how everybody else is, but then again, I've been around for you know longer than any one human should be in the this dirt. industry. Anyway, so <laughs> um, the so when you founded the company, I, I want to go for I, I want to hear how you went from being environmental artist to COO. So, what did you did you go to school for art? I did. Yeah, I went to school for digital media art. And so when it came time to start the company, did, was it planned for you to be, be CEO or how did you, it, it's interesting because it, it's, I always want to know how people make that transition from, you know, art or engineering or design or production to I'm running the company. Fair enough. We kind of winged it, I think. <laughs> uh, myself and, and my buddy Chris, who started the company, we were both artists. Uh, and and we, when we first started up the company and we were talking to our lawyer to get incorporated and all that, um, a lot of people told us it was kind of crazy for two artists to start a company without any you know, business training or, I don't know, just people who thought artists aren't really great people to run a company. Uh, and me and Chris kind of ran, ran everything ourselves. Uh, we kind of took turns being CEO, CFO, whatever. Um, the title is just kind of arbitrary just, just because we're a corporation. Um, but I think me and Chris, we're both smart guys, and we just we really wanted to do the company side of things, too. So it's a learning process. You know, it was a slow process learning how, how everything should be done and 
had to do all the you know boring side of things like accounting and <laughs> and paperwork and legal documents and all that stuff but I, you know we kind of figured it out um, and one of the, the great things about being in the area that i'm in uh, we have a small um they're kind of like an incubator they're called the generator or innovate niagara um, they, they help a lot of local businesses with a lot of the business side of things so they help uh, people find lawyers and accountants. Um, they give a lot of free um, advice. Uh, they'll sit down with you and look over documents and um, give you advice. So they're, they're partially government funded in that sense. Um, so we had a lot of really great resources to kind of help us get to you know, setting up an actual business. Well, don't worry. I mean, I'm pretty sure 95% of the companies in this industry wing it when they first get oh, yeah. started because <laughs> it's literally the only way, you know, you can you can figure it out in the first place. So yeah, that's why just jump in. here. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, jumping into more of the, of the company yourself now. So give us a short version of the company. I mean, how many how many people do you have in house? Do you use outside contractors? How is that split? Okay, so we, we've kind of gone through a lot of changes. Um, when we first started a company, there was actually six owners. That's when we first kind of initially started off. Uh, by the time we actually incorporated, it was just down to me and Chris. So we really started off as a two person company. You know, once we signed the paperwork and um, started discussing, you know, not getting paid for X amount of years to, to do a business and, and actually having to put money in. And a lot of the people that had started the company with us, you know, bailed really quickly. Uh, so for a long time, it was just me and Chris. Um, and eventually we brought on a programmer um, to kind of help Lost, you know, create the original Lost Orbit and do some prototypes and things like that. Um, and over the years, we've kind of um, went up and down, you know, hiring artists or, or different employees. Um, so it's always kind of fluctuating, and we use contract work a lot in, in that sense. That's because we never know, especially when we're doing outsourcing work. You don't know if a project's going to last a couple months or, or a year, so it's hard to maintain like a full set of employees. Um, over the last year, we've had um, there's about eight of us working here. So we had uh, myself, we had a few uh, full time artists and programmers. Uh, we recently recently got a community manager as well to kind of handle the Lost Orbit launch and do all that. So that was a lot of internal kind of um, employees. Uh, but a lot of the porting that we did for Lost Orbit was contract work as well with some friends that we had from you know, way back then in the, the AAA days. Um, so we kind of fluctuate you know, between employees and, and that. Um, after Lost Orbit came out, we actually ended up um, kind of downsizing a little bit uh, just because you know um, the game didn't do super great. And then uh, we had to kind of you know go back to um, starting up a new project and, and kind of having a smaller core team. So uh, we're down to a much smaller team now than we were over the last uh, year or so. I mean, yeah, and that's to be expected. You, when mm -hmm. you, I mean, that, that's the reality of this industry. It's, you can't just go and say, hey, look, we got 20 people and we're gonna have them employed all year long because you, you don't know. You know, mm -hmm. you, got, you do when you're doing production of a game, but once production ends, you know, what do you do? So when y'all first started, were you doing just simply straight art outsourcing? Yeah, myself and Chris, both being environment artists, and kind of having worked on it for a while, else? that was Sorry. primarily what we did. You doing uh, our first straight big art job that we got was working with Compulsion Games out in Montreal on the game Contrast. Um, those guys are making me happy few now and um, just got bought out by Microsoft recently as well. Um, so we actually did all the environment art for uh, Contrast at that time. So it was a really big project just for, for the couple of us. Um, and then throughout the years, we've primarily taken on art roles, helping a lot of local indie devs. We even worked with Ubisoft Toronto over the last couple of years. Um, and that's pretty much what we do. We did one project where we did um, a bit more of an involved project that required some of our programmers and whatnot. But um, I typically don't do a lot of those. We typically stay within our, our main focus, which is art. So how did you how did you make that step to creating Lost Orbit? Because it's when you're on that outsource, I call it the treadmill. You know, whether you're just doing art or whether you're doing full blown, you know, work for hire development for other companies, it's hard to get off that treadmill. You know, because you always want to think, well, we'll go out and get this extra work, and then with the profit from it, we'll put it back into our internal project but that's like rarely how it works out how did you go about managing that change from doing art outsourcing to doing your 
your first full game? I think a lot of it was my myself and Chris was willing to sacrifice quite a bit. So taking you know most of the profits from contract work and putting it back into the company. Um, one of the, the benefits of being in this area and kind of um, how I got lucky being able to do what I do is um, I also teach part time at one of the colleges here. So you know most of my actual income came from the college and myself and Chris didn't actually pay ourselves much. Um, you know for the first few years until we kind of got our footing on there but you're right like you do you know you do a contract work and you hope that the profits from that will sustain you but i mean unless you're charging you know quadruple what you're <laughs> what you're paying yourselves you know and, and i mean if a contract's only three months and you're you know you get an extra couple months out of that to do some work that's not really that much time to actually focus on your own game so one of the ways we did that is we took a lot of the money we had made contract wise um and then leveraged that to get um a grant for lost orbit so um Ontario is really, really awesome about um, having a lot of granting opportunities for the gaming sector. So we were able to utilize the money that we had saved up, um, applied for a grant with um, a program that we have here in Ontario called Ontario Creates, and then we were able to leverage that to actually focus on the game and get it out. Um, that was for the original release. For the re-release, um, that was all self-funded, so it took a really long time between releasing the original Lost Rover and then getting it out on on Switch and Xbox. And primarily because of that, because we were kind of, you know, do contract work, then jump onto Lost Rover for a little bit to do some work, and then back onto contract work. So it was a bit of a painful process to, to kind of, you know, go back and forth through that. But we felt it was worth a try to get it out on Switch and Xbox as well and see if it would do um, a little bit better on there than, than it had in the previous uh, release. It's, I mean, it, I don't want to understate how difficult that is for a company to do because it's, it's, I've seen, and I've even been a part of a company that, you know, went under trying to make that transition from contract work to, you know, full, full internal development. And, you know, Canada in particular, I know, I mean, you all have so many great programs, both from the federal level and from the provincial level, you know, everything from the, you know, the Canadian Media Fund through, through places like, you know, in Ontario, like you talked about. Um, it's, that, that's just a great achievement. I mean, and, you know, first off, congrats on that, because it's not something a lot of people can, can pull off. So you started the development of last orbit and then you know just to make your lives that much more complicated you're transitioning from contract art to full development and then you decide you know what let's just self-publish this yeah <laughs> so you know just stacking the difficulty levels on there you know how did you walk us through that you know internal conversation and, and that decision to do that versus going and, and, and finding a publisher to help you i mean to be fair you know looking back at it i kind of wish we did get a publisher because it did take <laughs> up a lot of our time and our money um and i think i think one of the problems that we had was um i think a lot of companies were doing really well with self-publishing when we were first working on lost orbit you know the industry wasn't as as crowded and i think um there was a lot of success with people just putting out their games through uh green light and and uh, getting their, the games out on um on playstation and stuff really early so we kind of felt hey you know what we have some good connections in the industry and and you know we have some good um funding from the grants and stuff that maybe we could give um, give it a try ourselves um and the other problem with it too is we didn't, we didn't really pitch it around to publishers but um lost Herbert's a really niche game so i think it would have been pretty hard to find a publisher that would have really you know wanted to take it on um it's a very strange game to try and market um and whatnot and we kind of knew that it was more you know we kind of wanted to make it and and uh we knew it was going to be a harder sell so um you know um but we decided to do that and again it would have been nice to get a publisher but i i think you know hindsight's always different right i mean i think if we did really well then i'd be here saying like yeah of course we self-publish it was the best idea i know it turned out really great um and then when we re-released the game just uh, last month, uh, we actually uh, tried to get publishers, but because the game had already been out on a couple consoles, um, that was an even harder sell to be like, hey, would you like to re-release this game on other platforms? You know, and I, that's something the publishers weren't really willing to, to take on, especially with the sales of the original game not being super great. 
you know. Um, so I think if the original release turned out really great and, and uh, sold a ton of copies and publishers, sure, you would have been, you know, happy to jump on there. But um, pretty hard thing to sell to someone be like, hey, I have this game, it's pretty cool, but it sold like no copies. <laughs> you want to invest a bunch of money into it and, and see if it does better, right? Um, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how that went. <laughs> it's not. I mean, so. <sighs> That has changed a bit in the industry. It used to be the case where it's like, absolutely. It's like, if you had already launched on anything, all the publishers were like, no, go away. I don't want to talk mm -hmm. to you, you know, and a lot of them still are because they want to control that, that conversation, that, that initial marketing push that goes out. But there are several publishers now who, you know, would totally jump all over, you know, the ability to go in and say, okay, look, you launched on, on Steam and, and PS4, and now you want to do a new launch on Xbox One and Switch. You know, that hat, that environment, that situation has actually changed for the better in the last couple of years. I mean, there are, uh, there are the companies that will do that. There's not nearly as many companies that will do it versus the ones that want to be involved from the get-go, but at least that option exists now. Um, so we got a question in the chat here. If you want me to jump in yeah, yeah, we yeah, from, yeah. from Twitch, uh, we have Krogs. I have a question about Ontario Creates specifically. How did applying for funding there work? I just looked at it and it looks like they only do music and film and books, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, so they actually have, um, they don't have a specific video game application. Um, they have uh, an innovation stream. Um, I believe it's called innovation still. I haven't applied for, for a, a little bit, but um, I'll have to look it up to see exactly what it's called, but they do have an innovative stream, and that, that's kind of what you apply for with games. And that covers a wide range of things, so it doesn't have to specifically be video games. It could also be um, any sort of interactive application for TVs or movies or other things as well. Uh, but they do get a lot of calls from video games, and that is, I think, one of the primary things they give out money for. Um, the process there is simple in many ways. I mean, you just you apply for the portal, um, as long as you meet their, their requirements for the type of company you are, the type of project you're making, um, and the type of funding you're looking for, you can apply. Um, it is an extremely competitive grant, though. Uh, I mean, year after year, there's more companies applying for it, and um, it's, it's very hard to get. Uh, and, and um, you know, definitely not everybody gets it. And even if you've gotten in the past, it's guaranteed that you'll get more money in the future for different games. So they kind of look at it on a game-by-game -game basis kind of um, assess things from there so hope that answers the question yeah i hope so let's see what, what's the next what's the uh you have any more for that there Krogs? if so just go ahead and ask in the chat anybody else have any questions go ahead and ask um did you want to continue jay yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just watching, you know, me. I get distracted with so many chats. It's uh... <laughs> right. Well, you know, did you see what I just, I just hit you on discord, but go ahead. Anyway, yeah, uh, I'll look in a second. I was, I was reading something different. So there are, I mean, I know it can be almost a full-time job applying for these grants. Have you ever looked at the CMF and, and how they do things and, you know, that particular route as well? Yeah, we actually, uh, for the projects we're currently working on, we received uh, some development funding from the CMF. Um, so we have gone through that as well. Um, and it's very similar in, in many respects. You know, they, they, they look for the same type of documents in, in some ways. Um, they all have their own specific uh, formats and, and information that they're looking for. But um, yeah, we've definitely gone through that. They, they, they have different um, amounts of money that they give out, different application deadlines. So it is kind of a full-time job, you know, you need to really know when to apply oh, for yeah. all these things, um, really looking for the type of language they're looking for, and it's um, it's quite a bit of work. And I know a lot of the companies that are very successful with these applications basically have someone that that's all they do, or they outsource that work to people that are really, really great at it. So when you've got all of this stuff going on, and how much of the actual art do you still get to do or have you, have you found your your job completely taken over by the business aspect of it yeah i basically just answer emails these days <laughs> yeah <laughs> especially the last few months like between lost orbit launching and, and doing the you know all the promo stuff um that's all i've been really doing i 
get to do a little bit of art, a lot of you know, high level stuff sometimes. Um, but now that we're kind of on a new project and then we're kind of getting down to a smaller team, I definitely will be stepping in there and, you know, doing a little bit more of that. Um, but yeah, for sure. When you're, when you're doing the full business and you got a bunch of people going and, and it's getting pretty busy, I mean, yeah, I'm mainly just emailing and meeting and playing and, and that's it. So. so are you going to go with the new project that you're working on? You have funding. Are you going to go look for a publisher in that one or are you going to self-publish again? I think we're going to look for a publisher this time. Uh, just, I mean, seeing how Lost Orbit came out and, and other games that are coming out from friends of ours, uh, it's really hard to make yourself stand out these days. Uh, and, I mean, you know, we could do marketing and we could hire some marketing professionals, but I think we just need more help on that side of things to get recognized and get you know, out, in the, out in the front of, of everybody. So ideally, we'd like to get a publisher. Uh, I mean, if that doesn't go well or if we can't find one, I mean, I think publish we have the, the contacts and the means to you know develop for the consoles and and still kind of um do that ourselves but it wasn't preferable i mean it, you know the game wasn't very successful in that sense so i'm looking at it from that point of view but also just from the amount of time it took away from making new content you know if i could leverage somebody else to do a lot of that and we making our next game i think that would be ideal as well because it, it took far too long between making Lost Orbit and then uh, the re-release, you know, I think we made another game in that time if we kind of leveraged some of the business marketing side someone else and then have them do that. <laughs> so what, I mean, we've talked in the past about what publishers do. And so this is a good segue. And if, if I get into area where you don't want to discuss something, just tell me, because otherwise yeah. I'm just going to keep asking questions until yeah, I mean, you're like, you know, ATM pin number and such. The, <laughs> We all know that everybody, you know, it's like, what do publishers do? Well, they give you money and they help you market it. Talk about some of those other areas where, I mean, it's like you said, it takes a lot of time and, you know, there's more to it than just the money and the marketing. Talk about some of those other areas where, you know, you're not as comfortable and you think a publisher could come in and, you know, either take something off your plate or add value in there. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the, the biggest values that I could see from a publisher, I mean, personally, I've never worked with one on our own projects, um, but seeing other people work with, with some really great publishers, I think having someone in there that releases a lot of games has a lot more information about, you know, what their consumer base is like and what they enjoy. Giving you feedback, you know, um, is the game you're making something that's going to actually sell? Like, is it worth your time? Which is something that we've actually got some good feedback from publishers before in the sense of we've pitched a game and they're just like, I don't think this is going to be something you can market, you know? And, <laughs> and I think that's good feedback, right? It's like, yeah, maybe it's a good game, but I don't, it's going to be really hard to convince people that they should check it out. Um, you know, I think that's very valuable, but also for me, one of the, the, the hardest parts about getting your game out there is communication, is, is telling people what is this game, what type of game this is, how does it play, and getting it to the specific consumers that want to play your game. Um, I feel that's really hard to do uh, with the amount of games that are coming out to find your specific market. And I feel if you find the right publisher for your game and the type of genre that you're making, I think they're really good at that. You know, um, and that's something that I would really like help with on the next project is, hey, we have this great idea. I think I know what the target market is, but you guys are going to be way better at finding that market and showing them this game. Um, so I don't know. That's kind of my point of view. Uh, I think it's easy to just, you know, market your game and buy Google ads, but if you don't really know exactly who you're marketing to specifically, I think that's tough, right? I and mean, help you get on that the better. So can you share anything about the new project right now? Um, it's super early on. Um, it's it's more of an action game over Lost Orbit. I mean, Lost Orbit is based and, and whatnot, but um, this is uh, more like a twin stick shooter, kind of. Um, so it's fairly, again, kind of in the early stages, so I don't really have too much to say that we're 100% committed to, that you know, we might not change. Um, but that's kind of the, the general idea of it. twin stick shooter you know, fight and shoot and stuff. So then I think it'll be a little bit easier to market um, with Lost Orbit. It didn't really fit a lot of genres and um, it didn't, you know, it was kind of hard to sell. So I think we're trying to make something that we enjoy, but is also something a little easier to talk about with, uh, with gamers. 
Okay, we got we got another question in the chat. I will field. Uh, Rhino Punch on Twitch says, "Given grants can be a pain in the ass, in your opinion, is it worth hiring a dedicated staff to focus on finding and acquiring those types of opportunities?" I mean, if you can afford it, I, I mean, I, you know. If you can you afford to spend the money to make the money, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you see game companies out on uh, CMF in there. You, can, you check who gets funding every every single round. And some of these companies are getting, you know, 900000 a million dollars each round or every couple rounds. Um, and that's a skill, right? I mean, if you can convince uh, the granting people to give you constant funding for new projects, I mean... Then it's worth uh, spending the money to get the people to do that. that. Right. Yeah, for me, that that's how I'd see it. I'd love to have somebody that's you know amazing at it and knows how to how to get those grants and knows what to say perfectly. Um, and definitely, if you can afford it, that's an that's absolute. It. You know, I learned when I started this company. The reason I started it was because. I was, you know, I didn't want to move to the West Coast and, and it was like, but I needed money, you know. So I had a friend that I was working with, you know, just doing contract biz dev for them, basically. And and he had a game design consultancy, and that's all it did was free to play game design. And I was like, you know, if there's a niche for that, there's a niche for you know business development consulting. And you know, luckily I was right. There's absolutely, if anyone out there, and, and you will need to be Canadian, I mean, but you can apply this to other countries as well. There are so many programs in Canada, you know, and a lot of them are dependent on which province you're in, but there is absolutely a niche for a consultant that does nothing but write grants. If there is one out there, somebody tell me. I've never seen it. I've never, you know, seen anyone doing this. But that is absolutely a gap in the market that could be, you know, filled in. Because you're right. It doesn't make sense to have somebody on full time, you know, all year round writing grants. There's just not that many grants to, to write in for. But to have somebody come in and as needed do it, I mean, that's that's absolutely a market. It's pretty crazy. And I mean, the other thing with grants too, why you might want someone around, maybe not like full, full time, but quite a bit is once you get a grant, there's a bit of upkeep with it too. You know, you have to submit reports every so often and then, um, you know, update your financials and things like that. So you do need someone to kind of continually update them on, on different things. And yeah, maybe it's not writing grants and maybe that's not their field of expertise. And you might have other people in your company that could just fill out, you know, um, kind of updates to, to all the granting stuff. So there's definitely a, a big investment in getting a grant too. Uh, and then at the end too, a lot of the, the granting companies will ask for um, some sort of audit as well. You know, you will need to provide a lot of financial documents about how you spent the money. Did you actually spend it on the things you're spending it for? Did you just buy a house and, you know, farm out some crappy game? Um, yeah, but I'm making a Sims yeah. expansion, so I needed the house. Yeah, it's research, right? <laughs> so it's kind of funny, but yeah. Um, it's it's a pretty crazy world, the whole grant world. <laughs> and you never know when it'll end, right? A new government might come in and be like, ah, this isn't worth it anymore and, and cut all the funding. Um, yep. We recently had a lot of cuts in the Ontario funding side of things. Um, luckily, none for games, but uh, a lot of the other sectors have gotten a lot of their funding uh, just cut this year all of a sudden. So. Uh, we you never know, right? Here, I mean, we, we yeah. used to have a, a wonderful tax program for movies and games in North Carolina, and that's why you saw so many movies being made here, Hunger Games and, and Cape Fear and a bunch of other ones that I don't remember off the top of my head. But then we had a new government come in, and they were like, oh, this is crazy. We don't need this, and they killed it. And all of the movie production packed up and went to Georgia. And so, you know, yeah. that's why The Walking Dead and the Marvel movies are filmed outside of Atlanta, not you know, outside of Wilmington where they are. So it is, you don't know when it's going to run out, but luckily you don't get into too many situations where you already have a grant and then they're like, oh yeah, that other half million dollars that we gave you, we're not going to, we're not, we're yeah, not going to They that. commit the money to you and, and, you know, off the bat, right? Um, but yeah, it's funny, like even Ontario Crates, like you were talking about Marvel, I'm always amazed when I watch a Marvel movie and there's an Ontario Crates logo at the end. 
That's I'm because like, oh, people yeah. are involved in everything. I know, it's like, crazy. We used to watch when my son was younger and he'd be watching cartoons. I'd be, I'd be like, okay, wait for it. At the end, that polar bear is going to pop up with a CMS <laughs> yeah. logo and they got money from the Canadian government somewhere. Um, yeah. A couple questions from Nightwolf in there. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to feel that. Okay, well, um, let's see. Well, well, I'll go backwards since uh, we were just talking about the, the grant money. Um, Nightwolf from t on Mixer says, if you do not make a deadline or if the game does not match up to what the idea or game design document you sent in, if needed, to get a grant, would it stop funding or even would they make you return the funding? They're usually pretty good on all that. Um, they understand game development is very iterative and things change. You know, they don't expect you to commit to an idea on paper and just make it, even if it sucks. Um, you know, a lot of times game design is like that, right? You're like, I have this great idea, and, you know, a third of the way through, you're like, that idea really sucked. But through testing and iteration, we have this idea that's much better. Um, so Hence Fortnite. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, there, there's a ton of games that have gone through that. I mean, even... With our games, like we, we've gone through that too. Lost Orbit was a really different game when it first started. I mean, I think when we first pitched it, it was a much slower mobile game. And then by the time we finished it, it was a console fast paced action game. And they were okay on it, you know? I mean, the thing they're mainly looking for is are you still spending the money on employees and on the things you said you're going to do? And is the project still going to um, be completed and I mean as long as you're doing that then they're, they're okay with that obviously you need to talk to them and you need to get approval from them and you don't want to surprise them at the end by like hey by the way we made a shooter instead of a board game or something um, <laughs> but <laughs> it was going to be know, Settlers of Catan but now it's you know kill the Settlers of Catan it's, yeah you know we had a change of heart so they're, they're usually good with that um, same with deadlines they understand uh, sometimes things slip or you know, you needed more time to do something. And for them, it's um, a lot of times it's, okay, we need another six months and that's going to take either X amount of money to, to prolong the production for that long. Or if there was a delay and you didn't spend any of that money for a bit of time, like you had to go work on a different game or do something else. Um, they're usually okay with that as long as there's some benefit to it. You know, if we told them, like we told them we're going to uh, delay the game we're currently working on because we wanted to do this Lost Orbit stuff. And they saw that as, uh, hey, that's good for you guys. You're expanding your game that we already funded. You're taking it to other platforms. Um, that's a good reason to delay your new project. Um, so they're okay with that. So they're, they're very reasonable. You know, they're, they're, they're people there, which is nice. You actually have human beings to talk to um, that understand you. It's not just like a rigorous, you know, yes and no kind of um, program. So... It's been really nice working with them on things, and they actually understand the industry, which is which is very nice. All right, so I've got a question for Alex before we get to the next question because yeah. it's going to like lead in there. All right, so tell for those for folks that don't know, tell us a little bit about Lost Orbit, you know the the gameplay and that sort of stuff, and talk about why it was difficult to get a publisher to see that vision on that game. Yeah, no problem. Um, so it was kind of funny the way everything kind of went down. So we started Lost Orbit as, as like a really small game that we wanted to kind of put out as our first game, as our studio. Um, and like many projects that everybody does, it ballooned out of scope and, and turned into something way more complicated than it should have been. Um, so initially it started off as a very simple um, mobile game where you play as a little astronaut and you're going to go from planet to planet um, and kind of use the forces of space to kind of navigate your way through different solar systems. And as we were making the game and iterating on it, we found out that we wanted to go faster and faster and the game kind of became deadlier. So what the game ended up being and, and the game you can uh, get right now, it's um, you play as Harrison, he's a little astronaut lost out in space. Um, his spaceship gets uh, blown up, so all you're left with is your jetpack. So it's, uh, it's an arcade style, very twitchy, fast game where you're going level to level, uh, dodging the heck out of stuff. Uh, so you're just going really fast, dodging asteroids, bullets, uh, space pirates, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but we ended up calling it a dodge em up because it was kind of like a shoot 'em up. It kind of looked like a shoot 'em up, but it just didn't have any guns. Um, and that's kind of what the game is now. So it's very story focused as well. So you have a little uh, buddy with you that tags along for the ride. You meet this little alien space probe and he narrates the game for you. So you kind of get to live through the story of, of this little guy trying to find his way. And, um, and um, you know, 
survive. So um, that's kind of the general idea. And um, I think one of the hardest things to, to sell to a publisher and even to an audience, as we've been kind of finding out releasing the game, is it's a really pretty game, but it's a very top-down looking game. And it's, it's kind of like an up-scrolling game. So I think a lot of people just look at it and think it's more of a mobile experience. Um, and from screenshots and videos, it's really hard to portray speed and skill. So I think a lot of people look at it and feel it's a really simple game in, in many ways. Um, but then when you play it, it's, it's pretty complicated. You know, the controls are, are very twitchy and tight, and there's a lot to it. Um, so for us, it's, it's really hard to convince people that, hey, this is like a really weird genre. That's really cool. You should check it out. And I feel publishers had the same reaction to it where they saw it and they're like, we get it. It's really fun, but this is going to be really hard to explain to people, you know, um, what this game is. Like, shooting up people might like it, but there's no guns, so they might not like it. Racing people might kind of dig it because it kind of feels like a racing game, but it's story driven. So we kind of, I mean, as far as like advice that I usually give to people, I kind of tell them not to make a game like Lost Orbit where, you know, it's a game you really like, but doesn't really fit in like a need or um, a genre that's really popular out there. So, um, and I, I think for a publisher, that's a big thing. You know, if it's not something that there's a big audience for, I don't think they see a, a reason to invest in it or, or what, you know, the amount of money it would take to, to market something like that to make it successful. So, I don't know if that kind of answers your question. Though. Yeah, I mean, sorry. So now that we got a little backstory on on what Lost Orbit is, Indy, I know we had a couple of questions that were pertaining to that and publishers. Yeah, that was, I think that basically answered that one question. Um, so, like, uh, Nightwolf had asked, so if it is unique enough, but fitting multiple genres to make its own genre, would it make it harder to get a publisher, even if the singular genre parts are popular and it is just a combination? That kind of, you kind of answered that. I guess it would really depend on what the genres are, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, and we had a, a a question similar in the Discord yesterday. You know, someone was asking about, you know, advice for getting up and giving like a, a two minute speed date pitch to publishers, and you know, one of the things that they said was it's completely unique, and you know, it's not like anything else out there, so it's hard to compare. And I said that's like gonna get you killed. You know, mm -hmm. you you can't go in with that statement because no matter how much you know a publisher always likes well we like new things they don't you know they like <laughs> new twists on old things because you know what a publisher does when they're sitting down you know they look at your the quality of the game and that sort of stuff you know is it fun but you know they also have to run a PL, you know a profit and loss statement on it so they've got to sit down and say okay here are you know five similar games and this is how they sold this is you know n now this is what we project your game is going to sell and that helps them make their internal decision on whether or not they want to do it and so if you go in and you're like oh it's like nothing else you've just pretty much you know tombstoned a lot of the publishers in the room because they have no way of projecting sales on it so you know, if you go in and you say it's, you know, but Super Meat Boy meets blah, 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 you know, that's the way to do it. You always want to be able to tie your your game to at least a genre and explain why it's going to appeal to that genre and then why it's a little different in there. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And that's something that I think was a big rookie mistake on our part when we first started the company. You know, we just wanted to make a game that we thought was cool, which a lot of people do, but we didn't really think about that side of it. You know, how are we actually going to pitch this to, to people and publishers or investors? Um, and even though the, the granting people were cool to, to give us funding for it, like, you know, they don't really look at it in the same way. For them, it's not as important that the game is successful or is marketable. They just want to make sure that you can finish it with the studio that you have. Um, and you're right, like the, the two games we always look at our game, oh, it's like Sonic and Frogger. You know, it's like this like super <laughs> weird It's Sogger. Niche, it's Sogger. <laughs> super fast Frogger in space. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why we self-publish, right? I mean, it's just one of those things where we just wanted to try it ourselves. And, you know, if, if people want to check it out, they might find something new that they like in there, but definitely not a giant audience for that type of game. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's uh, field this question. Another one from Krogs on Twitch. 
What kind of things does a publisher do for marketing? And how would you do those things when self-publishing? That's a good call. Um, I, they probably don't do anything too much different than what I would do in, in the sense of, you know, I mean, you put out press releases, you put out articles, you, um, you know, you do all your social media and stuff like that. I think the big part is, you know, if you go with a bigger publisher, like they, they have a following, they have gamers and, and fans of their types of games um, that they can directly market to, which is something that, you know, a small company may not have yet unless you have a pretty good fan base coming in already or you've established a different fan base from, from that kind of point of view. So with Lost Order, we ended up hiring a PR company and a marketing company to do uh, our press releases and our reach out to streamers and, um, and influencers and uh, websites for reviews and stuff like that. And they did a really great job on that. Um, you know, that was definitely something that I think we were pretty good at, especially with the original release when the game New. We got a ton of reviews for it and some good coverage. Um, and then we did a lot of marketing for this um, iteration of Lost Orbit. We got a lot of that on there. So, um, and we got a lot of really good advice from the companies that we were using. So I don't think they would do anything specifically too different in that sense. Um, a lot of times publishers are just really good at, I mean, again, this is my assumption. I've never actually worked with a publisher personally. So just looking at it from the outside. Um, I think a publisher just, you know, curates games, really. Um, when you go to, uh, when I, you know, I follow Devolver, I know most of Devolver games are going to be within set genres or styles or moods or weirdness or whatever it is. And and I know that any game that they are marketing, um, I'm probably going to want to at least take a look at because I really like the types of games they're doing. So I think if you could align yourself with a publisher that has the vibe and the feel that you're going for and they already have audience they could they market to i think that's their biggest value over doing it yourself but um, again that's kind of my interpretation of, of watching friends release games with publishers and looking at the industry but again i haven't done it personally so um i could be totally wrong so i mean you're you're pretty much on i mean the i like to say you know self-publishing is like golf you can watch somebody else do it and it's like oh wait I can do that. That's that. I mean, if you play golf at all rec recreationally, there's a part of you that says, oh, I could do, I could be on the yeah. tour. I just need to, you know, <laughs> knock 20 strokes off my game. The, the basic fundamentals of publishing haven't changed. You know, you have to build the distribution networks, which is, you know, make sure that your game's going to get on, on Steam and GOG and, and Epic and all these different stores. You have to market it, which is, like you said, press releases, articles, you know, traditional reviews, and now, you know, social media influence, I mean, social the social influencers, streamers, that sort of stuff. Um, and then, you know, but you've also got a lot of little things in there like, okay, who's handling q and A? I I mean, who's handling QA? Who's handling, you know, localization? You know, are we sure that it's going to, you know, work on these platforms when it goes out? You know, how, are we managing a community? There's a lot of little things in there that are kind of the, in the back burner. And yes, a indie studio with the right financing can do this. You know, you can hire all the people that you need to get it done. Is it going to be as effective and as, you know, well greased as, as a publisher coming in and doing it? Probably not, unless you've done it before. Um, but, you know, they're going to have better access to influencers. They're going to have better access to the media. Press, I mean, because yeah. just, just because you send your press release out doesn't mean anyone's actually going to read it. You know, press releases are, you know, at this point in the industry, they're nice to be able to put on your site and to get you out there every now and then and, and have Google pick you up as, as something that's, you know, alive. But you don't have a lot of people reading, you know, just press going releases. Read press releases yeah. these days. Uh, but I'm like, like what you said, like when Devolver puts something out, you're like, I know exactly what this is. I know this is going to be good. It's going to be a good game. So like when press gets something from Devolver, they go, oh, it's a Devolver game and they're they're going to open it. You know what I mean? So and that's, that's the same with, with consumers. You know, they have an amount of trust that goes into, okay, this isn't like just some random game that this company thinks is good and therefore they put it on the internet. You know, it's okay. It's coming from, you know, this publisher that I, I like and I respect. So it must not be horrible. Let's go and, right. and give it another look. So it's not 
you know, rocket science to get in and start self-publishing games, but it is a situation where you need people involved who are experienced. And, and who have done it before, so you know all the nuances. And so when you pitch your article to, you know, Kotaku or, or, or PC Gamer or whoever you're sending it to, they actually read it and are interested in, in you know, writing something about it versus going, oh, okay, it's an, here, here's another shooter that's coming down the market. We'll see how it does and go from there. So it's, it's not that there's a skill in there that publishers have that, that no one else has, which is the way it used to be, frankly. Now it's more of they've got more experience. They understand it better. They are better at getting it out there than, than a single developer who launches one game every two years. Yeah, right. and I, I think it's just a good filter, too. Like, there's just so many games coming out these days. You know, even as a gamer, like, it's so hard to check out everything or, you know, to find something that you like. So you kind of look to curators on Steam, and, and a lot of times the publishers are the curators where they're. They're the ones, you know, finding their audience for, for me, and and, um, and that's interesting. And then I, I think the other thing, too, is, um, uh, you know, distribution-wise, um, even though Nintendo and Sony and a lot of the Microsoft are pretty friendly with indies these days, I've had a lot of friends that have tried to get dev kits and approval to release on certain systems, and they still get turned down. Um, and so I think once you get a publisher, obviously that becomes a lot easier. They can get you the, you know, the rights to, to put out it on, uh, on the and stuff. That's funny. Yeah, sorry, I was laughing at chat. It was our, our friend Pseudo Shadow from the Internet Game Database said, imagine if there was only a database of these publishers. I'm like, really? <laughs> Where could we find that? It's probably going to be at IGDB.com. That's the um, th that's a wonderful resource. And if you don't know, just as an aside, because I love these guys and, and I like to plug them, if you don't have a press kit for your game, you can actually go and when you make your game site on IGDB, it becomes a press kit for you. So you don't have to worry about that aspect of, of you know, marketing your game. There you go. Free press kit. Um, where were we? I had another question. Was there another question in, in chat that we missed, Andy, that I missed? I, I'm sure if anybody missed it, it was you. Um, so <laughs> Chocolate Rain did say, arguably, influencer marketing is more important than Kotaku slash PC Gamer that nobody reads these days. You know, um, oh, Nightwolf. Nightwolf said, so a lot of industry research, public speaking, and understanding who your game could appeal to would be best to get down in preparation for talking with publishers in regards to unique genre games, probably in, in regards to all games. Yeah, I mean, but even more so if it's something that's that's unique. You know, it, you you have to be able to you know really communicate this is why this game is going to be appealing because it's a part that's understood and this is the reason why it's different than everybody else and we're not just like putting out you know the 538th metrophania game for 2019 yeah, you still need to stand out in some way, but it needs to be a, a good standout, not a scary standout for a publisher, you know, where it's like too different or too weird or too, I don't know, alienating for some reason. <laughs> uh, but we actually had a funny experience with that with our one of the games we were working on before. Uh, we had this idea that we wanted to make a game kind of like Descent. I don't know if you guys remember those Descent games from way back when. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, now, now I feel like Tony Stark and, and you're, you know, Spider Man in these movies. Hey, you remember that that Empire Strikes Back game? For, movie for, <laughs> yes, I remember Descent. I played Descent. Yeah, <laughs> like me and Chris were the only ones that knew of those games in our entire office. So that's kind of how oh I, I feel that way. Yeah, a lot, a lot of younger people. Hey, so we wanted to make this Six Degrees of Freedom um, kind of game where you're you're playing as this, um, the ship and you're exploring this environment in in full full freedom, kind of. Kind of sets, and we we kind of did this early pitch for the game, and a lot of publishers and, and investors that we talked to were like, "Yeah, I don't know, if, I don't know if people really want this game anymore. You know, if they want these types of games, I think if you were if you were Descent, maybe you would have some some clout to kind of you know really re release it or whatever." But um, and then we kind of went back and looked at the numbers, and you have you know let's say the the type of games that are coming out like Descent are selling you know whatever fifty thousand units each or something like that at the most. 
um, or there's, you know, 100,000 people out there that really want Descent games, you basically have to make like a perfect Descent game to capture that entire audience base and then maybe break even. Or you pick a genre that's a lot bigger, um, that has a much wider audience, and you make a game that only appeals to 10% of those people, you could still get potentially more people buying your game off a genre that's a little bit more popular and, and interesting to market to. So uh, it's been kind of an interesting learning experience for us, talking with publishers and investors and getting their feedback on you know, why they choose certain games or how. And, and it's kind of changed our way of thinking about let's make a project we really love, but let's also make a project that's a little bit easier to talk about and pitch and market. Um, and I, I think that's just part of the experience. Unfortunately, it took a really long time to learn, but you know. <laughs> I just noticed there's a bottle of Jägermeister sitting behind Alex, and I'm like, hey, <laughs> uh, yeah. my new favorite developer. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> pretty good i, I forgot that was there <laughs> we're not part of game development you know <laughs> hard alcohol so it helps you, i mean you're right you, you've got to have that that balance in there but it, a, a good aspect or you know a, a good side effect of this you know democratization of game development now which is you know we're not totally defined on the only things that are going to go to market are what Walmart and Best Buy and GameStop think they can sell on their store, you know, on their shelves, which is the way, you know, things used to be. But you're seeing a lot of games come back that quite frankly would never have been funded by a publisher over the last, you know, five or six years. I mean, if you had taken, you know, something like Celeste or Super Meat Boy to a publisher 10 years ago, you would have gotten laughed out of the room, you know, because they're like, there's no way we're going to, no one's going to buy that. Mm -hmm. What they mean is not enough people are going to buy that to make it worth our time. But now you're seeing more of these things and you can reach back and go, Hey, you know, this is a game, you know, like Descent that sold really, really well back in the day. There hasn't been anything like it, you know, recently. And so we think we're going to fill a market. And so, you know, for those of you out there who are going, okay, so how do we figure that out? Go to places like Steam Spot. Go look at rankings on App Annie. And, and, and you know, if you're doing an app, you know, that sort of thing. You know, no, Steam Spot isn't going to give you exact numbers anymore, but it does give you a very good barometer of here are the games that are you know similar ours in genre and and gameplay and this is roughly what they're selling and you can take it from that point yeah that's kind of what we do too i mean steam, steam spy is a pretty good resource even if the numbers are very vague at least it lets you know right if you know you keep looking at a genre that you really like and everybody's selling zero to you know, 5,000 units or whatever is their, like, main thing. You're like, okay, maybe that's not the best, you know, genre I want to pick at. Or maybe you think that it is really good and just, you know, no one has made a game that you really like in it, but that's usually not the case, right? That's usually the that's usually the excuse that they can use to convince yourself to make a game that you think will be successful even if nobody really wants it. But, I mean, just the games what? industry. If, if you've got the resources to make that game and self-publish it and you know go with it from there and not completely like lose your house in the process do it you know go out there and put something out there that you know no one else has done because i mean the reality is if it's that new and you know completely out there you are going to be the only one doing it and you're going to have a hard time finding a publisher but you know don't not do it just because you don't think someone you know no one's going to like it or right or new, new genres have there. to come from somewhere Exactly. You know, just make sure you do it wisely and you don't go and, you know, like I said, mortgage your house and everything you own on something that may sell 500 units. For sure. I mean, that was kind of our thought with Lost Orbit too. It was, you know, when we got reviews for it, some people thought it was okay, but we got a lot of reviews where we really, really enjoyed it, you know, and, and we knew that there is a small market of people that thought it was an amazing experience. And same with taking it to PAX and whatnot. You know, most people were kind of thrown off by the twitchiness of it or the type of genre a lot of people were like where are the guns and kind of walked away um well you know once in a while you have someone come to your booth and they're amazing at it from the get-go and buy a copy right then and there or you know just really sold on the idea and so you're like yeah you know what there's not a lot of these people but if we can get you know there, there is a market there's somebody that's going to love this game and that was our thought of lost orbit too it's like it probably won't do well but you know there's a really good chance or there is a chance that 
we can put it out and it will find that market um, and enough people will catch on and tell their you know their, their friends and or catch on in some sort of way and there is a chance right yeah, yeah i mean I, I totally agree with you it's not maybe the best like business strategy for putting out something that is a long shot but i mean you, that shouldn't stop you right i mean that's not really what the games industry is only about it's, it's about still creating something so I mean, and I've done a lot of niche products over the year and quite frankly made a lot of money off of, of niche products over the year. When we first, you know, I, I did the deals for the first publishing for Paradox on Europa Universalis and Hearts of Iron and that whole series. And, you know, back then going to somebody, you know, going to publishers and saying, okay, look, here's a very hardcore, you know, epic simulation type thing where you're basically pretending to be a country in, in Europe in the Renaissance in the Middle Ages, that was a niche audience, but it was one that was underserved. And, you know, they had a great launch and, you know, it launched Paradox to where they are now today. And that was like 18, 19 years ago, maybe <laughs> it was a long time ago. But, you know, there is that possibility, you know, but it's a matter of, you know, making sure you're targeting that right niche and you're making something that is actually appealing to them and not something that you think is appealing to them. So, mm -hmm. but you brought up a good question when you're talking about somebody coming to your booth and buying the game. How did you market Lost Orbit initially on the first launch and then, you know, on this on this new re-release, what did you do in terms of, of marketing? Was it shows? Was it, you know, articles, streamers, how did you do it? We did a little bit of everything, I guess. We we got a PR company to do the review, you know, press release kind of round. Um, and we got a lot of reviews for the original game. Um, I think we got over like 20 or 30 like Metacritic reviews in total between the different consoles. Uh, so we did a lot of that. Uh, we did do a streamer push. Um, that's something that I would really like to do better. Um, and I, I feel the, the type of game Lost Orbit is it shows really well when someone is playing it and reacting to it. And finding the right streamers for it is really hard. Because um, you can find people to play your game, but if it's not really their genre or they don't, they're not really picking it up, they play it really slowly and not really showing it up in the way that, you know, people are excited about it. So it's really hard finding the, the you know, the specific streamers that are going to play your game in its best light, I guess. Um, and I think it was just hard to convince people to play, you know, this like weird game too. So it was, it was pretty tough finding streamers. Uh, but we did that as well. And then uh, we did shows like we did PAX and uh, The Mix and um, uh, what else? A lot of local shows around here too, like EGLX and whatnot. Um, and this time around, we kind of did the same thing. We, we did a little bit more of everything, I suppose. We did um, a bit of a bigger PR push just because we knew it was a re release. So it'd be a little harder to get people's attention. So we kind of spent a little bit more time and money on that. Uh, we did a little bit um, on the ad front, which I don't really know if that really brought in much, but you know, we kind of wanted to give it a try. Um, and then we did a lot more on the influencer side. Like we really hit Mixer really hard because that was, I think, a community we thought we could reach really well because it was kind of up and coming. So we got some pretty good uh, streams on there. Um, so we kind of did a little bit of the same stuff. Um, shows were a little bit harder this time around because I think people weren't as willing to, to accept us into booths because it was a re-release. You know, they're like, oh yeah, I guess people have played this already. It's just on a different console, even though we added content and stuff to the game. So um, very similar. I think uh, one of the things that changed a little bit for us was our, uh, our message of the game. You know, last time we focused a lot more on um, just the speed of it this time we focused a little bit more on the story side of it because we felt people really resonated with the, the narrative side of the game last time but it's not something we really marketed towards too so this time we tried pushing a little bit more on the cinematic uh, kind of story side so we kind of changed our message around a little bit but that was that was kind of the, the big difference i i, I think you, you, you want to get that question sure let's do that question night wolf again would like to know um you know, talking about reaching out for publishers um, and the different genres. That's another thing, too. I'm like, is it genre? Is it genre? Is it niche? Is it niche? I mean, who knows? Um, so Nightwolf says, would time manipulation be out be too out there? 
seen it in only a few games with braid and quantum break being notable ones there's also that one hot shot is that what it's called hot shot that one was super popular what was that what was that time manipulation game where time only moves when you move was that hot shot jay super hot super hot super that hot. was it yeah that like is super popular that actually came out prince of persia yeah heine what's up buddy um the same deal with swinging our grappling grappling hook like spider-man ps4 and just cause too unique popular wanted mechanics but very difficult to implement what would most publishers decide on for a game having either one or both that is a hard That's a question. Really specific question. Yeah, yeah, I'm not really sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the only experience I really have with like genre-wise and publishers is um, I don't remember the, the publisher specifically, but for one of our new games, um, one of the games we're pitching, uh, the kind of story and idea um, of the game fit this one publisher that we reached out to, but they did very different genres. Like they, they mainly dealt with like strategy type games, and ours is more action based. But dealt with very similar themes that a lot of their games deal with um and they actually wrote us back a really nice email saying like hey this idea sounds really good um we just don't think it would fit our audience like we could market it and publish it but i, I think our audience is looking for when they come to us they're looking for strategy games or paced games so they were very open to us and saying like hey this game is cool it's just not fitting our audience right now or the type of audience we publish to so that was a really good feedback for us to know, like, yeah, not every publisher will want to hear from you. They they only do RTSs. They're really going to want to publish, you know, like a soccer game or, or something for you, right? Um, as far as, like, specific mechanics, yeah, I'm not really sure how to answer that one. Um, I don't know if they're as picky about that. Maybe more genre or theme type, like the, the content. It's... it's... <sighs> You don't want to pitch it. I mean, like, you can't go in and say, I have a time manipulation game because time manipulation isn't exactly a, a genre that's well defined and well established. But you can create that sort of game. It's a matter of how do you pitch it? You know, and so you can look at it and say, okay, do we want to make it more of an action game or a platformer or a puzzle game? You know, there's the game that's, you know, it's really simple. It's on itch and, and I want to say flash, but flash doesn't really exist anymore where you're, you've got like a box and a little arm and you're basically climbing up all of these, you know, obstacles, you know, that's something along the same lines and it's become, you know, very, very popular, but you, it, there's that little art to the pitch, you know, despite the way that you think the game is, is defined, it's a matter of tweaking that pitch to the publisher and putting it in terms that, you know, they understand and that they're going to relate to. And so you may have a publisher that does a lot of, of platformers. And so you want to go in and say, you know, this is a, we're adding a new twist on, you know, the, the old platformer model by using, you know, time manipulation and your player is going to have a grappling hook they can use to get from place to place. You know, there's different ways that you can, phrase it and it just comes down to tailoring that pitch to the publisher that you're dealing with and you know and that's where things like you know using places like steam and, and steam spy and <clears throat> the guys over at you know igdb too you know you can go and search a search for publishers by genre and then you know help narrow that list down to you know where you get it to something manageable basically uh but it's you know you can't necessarily go in and say okay i want to do a you know we're doing a time manipulation game or we're doing a grappling game tailor it and anchor it in something a little you know more understandable immediately because you want that publisher to have a mental picture of what it is like immediately not have to like think through it if you make people think they lose interest and therefore they go on to the next thing so th that's my two cents <laughs> oh we have a comment from heine too personally i would be careful and not being overly creative in the netherlands we have way too many devs and with our country being very small they all try to compete in who is the most original and in the end we have the worst industry in income per dev. <laughs> Originality is very important, of course, but be wary that you should not stray too far from what is familiar to mainstream since most accidentally already aim for the niche market. 
Tiny, was, what you should do is structure a deal with all of those, you know, developers who have self-published and create a compilation pack of, you know, here's, you know, 20 really highly original games from the Netherlands and you sell that as one pack and that way you, you tap a lot more people. We don't do that anymore. That's one of the things that the industry, we used to do that so many, you know, when we had retail, that was like the standard life cycle of a game. And that's gone now to a certain extent. You know, the like, the subscription services have kind of picked it up. But I mean, back in the day, it was like you released the game. If the game was successful enough, you released a add-on pack or two add-on packs. And then it went to budget and then it went to bundles where, you know, you would go into the store and there's like, you know, here's five RTS games in, in, in one box. And it would be a little cheaper than buying a $60 new game, but it was a way of extending that life cycle. And we don't have that anymore. You know, there's nobody going yeah. on Steam and saying, here's, you know, five indie games that, you know, came out originally at 20 or $30, but we put them all together into a bundle. I think uh, PS4 does that a little bit. They have like a uh, couple like Indie Darling bundles or Indie or, Darling. You know, like oh, company. Darling. <laughs> in, in, yeah, they Indie Gala does that. Humble Bundle. Hey, Draw, welcome. I'll but go. as far as develop, I mean, so that's what we're saying. It, you know, it's gone to the subscription services and yeah. the platforms themselves doing it, but we don't have developers banding together and you know doing this collectively because i think there's a big there's a big opportunity there because you can't wait as, as a small team especially you can't wait until you know humble calls you up and goes hey do you want to be in a bundle because i'll tell you who gets in the majority of those bundles and it's the people that already have the relationship with humble or they already have the relationship with sony or, or you know whatever the platform is and so i think there's a wonderful opportunity in there for you know, to come in as to, for developers to band together and say, hey, look, here's this game that we're going to release and we're going to release this bundle pack of it. That's just, you know, my opinion. It's a missed opportunity. It's a new opportunity. Somebody could still do it, though, you know. Yeah, it's interesting. But by not doing um, it, it's a missed opportunity. I had a, I had another question, and now I completely, you know, lost my train Brain fart. Oh, okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go. So, and, and you've talked on this a little bit, but were there any, I mean, aside from how much time everything took, what were the major hurdles that you didn't see coming when you all started, you know, self-publishing Lost Orbit? Um, I think one of the biggest hurdles was just finding a team, um, which I mean, was, it's kind of something we we knew was going to happen uh it's just myself and chris being artists i mean we couldn't really do the whole game ourselves not you know we could eventually i'm sure we could learn a little bit of programming and then put out some kind of broken game but um uh, you know finding a team that we really liked and then and could really work with and finding people to work with us that was really hard especially i mean we're out in st Catharines here in ontario which is like a small town with i mean really the only games company that was here before was silicon knights and after they went under a lot of people left so there's a few devs that kind of stuck around here so it was hard finding a team to, to kind of do everything that we needed to um so that was probably our biggest hurdle uh, and then secondly when we re-released the game on switch and xbox uh we were, we were a unity dev um, because of the you know, large amount of time we took in between the two titles, it was kind of a pain in the butt upgrading to a, a newer version of Unity and, and kind of re-implementing things. Um, so that's kind of a big technical part of you know doing that. Um, but yeah, it was probably just team, you know, finding a solid team that we want to work with. That's I think is always one of the hardest things for for any dev is finding people to work with that you know you really like and, and you can rely on and and actually want to work with you at, at a you know full time basis or you know that, that kind of thing, right? So I mean, we're we're nearly out of time. Well, we are kind of out of time, but we're going to go a few more minutes if if you're cool with that. Yeah. The, so how did you go about finding the people? What, you know, did you, was it just friends of friends that you knew? How did you go about building that team out? So yeah, originally it was kind of uh, either old colleagues from Silicon Knights that were still in the area that we maybe didn't work with super closely together at the company, but then we kind of found out they, they stayed here and you know, were interested in working on some stuff. Um, so that was kind of the initial um, 
kind of team building thing. Uh, and then a lot of the new team that we have is, is actually a lot of junior people that we have trained up. So because I teach at the college, I get to kind of cherry pick some of the best people, you know, graduating. Um, and so we kind of um, did that, you know, once we wanted to kind of grow the team a little bit, we decided, yeah, we could try and find some senior people and, and bring them on. But, you know, they either want, you know, like a really well-established job that they know they'll have for a long time or, or want to move into a bigger company. Whereas juniors, you know, they're, they're you know, recent grads or people that have been in the industry for a short amount of time are willing to give a smaller indie company a chance, even if they know that it's not super stable. So we end up spending a lot of time hiring, um, you know, grads and things like that and then training them up and doing contract work with them to, to kind of uh, build up the team that way. And, I, you know, right now I probably have the best team I've ever had in my life with, is kind of on the same page and we're all really committed to what we're doing and you know that's that's kind of the best part about building a team together as opposed to getting somebody super senior that kind of knows what they're doing right off the bat and you know might not like the way you're trying to do things so i don't know it's, it's tough but that's kind of where we are right now so did you go with the philosophy of hire for a culture fit or more hire for hire for a skill fit Definitely culture, I think, um, and personality. I mean, uh, because I teach at the college, we get to do capstones together and, and go through projects. And I mean, um, I obviously look for talent as well in either art or programming or not. But I mean, I've had really talented programmers coming out of the school that I know I could never actually work with, you know, with somebody that I couldn't talk to or, you know, bounce ideas off of. So for me, and, and I know a lot of the studios that I talk to, like, culture fits almost more important than ability a lot of times because you, know, you put someone in a full-time job they can get really good at what they're doing if they have base skills to, to get better but if they're a giant weirdo or an asshole i mean it's kind of hard to, <laughs> you know, to, change, to change that around right? or a so, giant weird asshole that's I'm right. Right. Oh, yeah yeah i'm pretty sure i'm the middle of that venn diagram <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> that's funny so draw says we enjoyed lost order our review for it gets published soon tell us where it will be draw yes draw oh it's going to be on the drastic measure you should be able to put a link in there dude oh awesome oh let's see because that's important i mean it's it's very hard with all these different you know markets and out that you know markets but you know websites and and streams and all this sort of stuff it's hard to sometimes know if someone's looked at your game and, and if so, where it is, I mean, you can always do a, um, what are the, a Google, Google word search. I don't know. There's a technical yeah. term for it. Anyway, it emails you every time you put, if you like put the lost orbit in quotes, it will email you every time it finds an article about the lost orbit. When you're, when you're going to, um, when you were researching streamers, Alex, what did you use something like Google a alerts. keymailer or a Wuvit, or how did you find Google alerts? Thank you, Chocolate Rain. Yeah. Um, how did you find the right streamers? Was it a lot of you know searching and putting in a spreadsheet, or did you did you use something in particular? Um, so the PR company that we hired, they did a lot of that for us. Um, we left it up to them to kind of um, track down streamers that they thought would really fit our, our brand. And then personally, yeah, we spent a lot of time just, you know, watching people and seeing the types of games they're playing and trying to reach out personally um, to them that, you know, we felt was a really good fit. Um, and then with Mixer, we, we put out like a key request class kind of thing where, where streamers would uh, request keys from us. We luckily ended up having a contact with um, a streamer at Mixer that knew a lot of the other streamers and was kind of able to get us in contact with them. Um, but it was really hard, right? I mean, um, and I mean, we're still out there trying to find more people to play the game and and to find the um, you know that community that we think will really latch onto the game to it. Um, so it's been really hard, and that's kind of why we went with a company to help us with that, just because. And that's like a whole full-time job on itself is just, you know, trying to understand the, the influencer market and something that, you know, I'm not super great at. So that. That's a good idea, Draw, a show on, on, on SEO. So we did a show, and it's not on the podcast yet because I haven't got that far down the list, but we did a show on App Store optimization. Um, we haven't done one on on pure seo but i'm assuming that's what you're talking about draws is you know more on the app store steam store 
type engine optimization or did you mean like straight up web seo yeah okay all right yeah, that's it we did one a while back and i'll i'll dig it up uh with with nav uh, nav gupta he, he came on our twitch show but i'll have to actually pull that one up i'll make it a priority to put back on um to put on the put on the podcast list but yeah it wouldn't hurt to do another one i mean that's that's something that is desperately needed i mean we discoverability is the big issue so if you you know have a good seo on your steam page or your app store page or, or wherever it is it's going to go a long way to helping uh helping you get everything done uh if you've got any more questions throw them in chat wherever you are we're live on mixer youtube twitch periscope twitter well it's per twitter periscope yeah yeah um yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. You can't put a question in on Periscope, Periscope. or you can, we're not going to see it in our, in our nice unified chat. Uh, but yeah, toss out any questions because we're going to be wrapping up here, here very shortly. So you, you bit the bullet, you self-published the first game, you got financing for the next one through the wonderful, you know, coffers of the Canadian government hey. and you're going to, but you think you're going to go find a, a publisher for the next one. Yeah. So we only got funding for the development side of it to kind of make the, the prototype. So our, our goal right now is to put together a demo and then either pitch it out to either investors, uh, go for more rounds of funding, um, and then try and get a publisher. That, that's our kind of our, our big goal this time around. We want to step it up and uh, try and get a, a good publishing deal. And try that. I mean, maybe that won't work either. See, but <laughs> well, I hope I, I get I, I hope I get an inside look of the game before anybody else gets. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely let you know. Okay, good. Yeah, that way we can sell the keys. I mean, yeah. no, that's not what, that's <laughs> what you. That's um, what you. That's <laughs> you're the key seller. All right, so you know, I don't see anything coming in immediately. So let me ask you directly, then, Alex. Are there questions about the looking for publisher process that you have that you know that we can chime in on while you while you have our ear here? Um, that's a good question. I mean, uh, we had a lot of luck the last time we pitched to publishers or chatted with them. Mainly, we we made a lot of um, uh, kind of contacts and met with them personally at GDC. So that worked out really well. Um, but yeah, if you can give any other kind of insight on how to approach different publishers, um, what type of ways you could communicate with them that you know isn't just like a cold call out of nowhere, um, any kind of advice like that is always great. So. I mean, I totally didn't do this as a lead in. We're actually doing a webinar tomorrow and we're going to do more of them. I'm just one of those that I finally bit the bullet and, and we're going to do one. We're going to do a webinar on, um, you know, the whole process of narrowing down the publishers and how to pitch to them. But from the overview, I mean, you want to make sure first and foremost that you're reaching out to all your possibilities. So I see a lot of developers and, and I talk to them and they, and they have a fairly, you know, they have a good game that would be widely accepted by a lot of publishers. And they're, I'm like, how many publishers did you send it to? And they're like, three. Yeah, yeah it's like three. It's less than three, 15. my very favorite ones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, you have to remember that there are, I mean, we track over 500, it may be over 600 publishers globally now. So there are, a lot of options out there depending on what you have. And so you need to go through and one, start with that huge list and you can get that list at www.powellgroupconsulting.com slash publisher dash list. It will, you put in your email address, it'll send you the list. You can start there and then you need to start, you know, segmenting by platform, by genre and by budget. You know, there are publishers who aren't going to put any financing in, but they'll help you on the, the QA and, and, and the localization and the marketing and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. Um, there are some that only want to put in like up to 50 grand. Uh, and there's all these, you know, different markers where, where publishers go. We usually segment them in our system to the under 100,000 group, the under 500,000 group, the under a million group, and then like everybody else. Um, but get that list down and then 
you know, cold calls don't work anymore. As much as the old salesman to me is like, you need to get on the phone and call people. If you call me out of the blue, that's like one of the easiest ways to piss me off. It's like, I, I have in the middle of shit. I don't need to be, you know, I don't need you calling me right now. Um, Isn't that weird but, how know, it's gotten to that? You're like, oh my God, is. I don't know this phone number. I'm not going to answer it. I will answer every yeah. single call that comes in. I don't care. Well, you're you're better than me because it's got. I mean, you get so many robo calls now. Oh like, yeah, so many. You know, I, I don't I don't answer them either. But so we do outreach in three basic forms. It's like one is is email. I mean, if you have the company's, you know, you know who that contact is, and you have their email address, you just email them. Say, hey, look, this is what we got. Um, Twitter is a good way, and then Discord. We use Discord. I mean, not only for the show, you know, you can join our Discord is simply indie game business. You type that in and you you, you go to our, our Discord page. But there's a lot of, you know, business to business stuff that we use Discord for. I mean, if you think about it, most every publisher that you're going to pitch an indie game to has their own Discord page. And if they don't... So, yeah, if they don't, then you have a, a, a serious concern there, you know, but they have a Discord page. And so it's it's literally as simple sometimes as like looking up their Discord page and then looking to see who's an admin and sending those people a message. And a lot of times it may be that that's going to be the community members of the PR or the marketing team, but they can typically tell you either who the person is that you need to talk to, or they'll point you to like a general submissions page, you know, which is fine and dandy as well. You just got to make sure you follow up with them. But, you know, a lot of the, the work and, and the biggest problem I ever, I always see developers having is they didn't pitch their project to enough publishers. And so that's the first thing I would recommend, you know, make sure that you're not just going to these 10 publishers that you know, because there's probably another 10 X that, that are possibilities for you. That's interesting. That's good. So, yeah. And then someone asked what that site was again, and, and Indy posted it, but for those of you in podcast world, www.powellgroupconsulting.com, you know, Powell Group Consulting is our our firm that does the, the, the real work out there. Um, indie game business is, is our, is our pet project, but go to powellgroupconsulting.com slash publisher dash list. And that will send you to a little screen and it'll say, put in your, put in your email address and it'll send you your, whatever the, the, the list for you. So, um, Alex, Dude, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, we love yeah, having these, you. these, you know, conversations and it's one of like our most requested feature is I want to hear from other indie devs and how they've done stuff and, and, and what worked and what didn't. So I appreciate you coming on and being so open with us. No, thank you for having me on. It's, it's always great to chat. And so we can go to, what's the site to, for Lost Orbit? I know I posted it earlier, but now I've like, you know. Oh, it's uh, pixelox.ca slash Lost Orbit if you want to kind of find out about the game, but it's on every store page now, so Microsoft. It's uh, everywhere. <laughs> it's every it's freaking everywhere. Where. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah, Steam, uh, Switch, Xbox One, and PS4. No Stadia, sorry. Well, no, don't get on <laughs> Stadia right now. Um, and all right, so and then Friday we've got at least Brandon. I don't know if Larry's going to be here or not, but at least Brandon from Game Dev Unchained. They were kind enough to have me on their podcast a, a month or so back. But they've got an interesting story as well. Both of them are, you know, experienced AAA developers that worked on Call of Duty and, and a lot of major franchises. And then they said, okay, let's let's be an indie dev. And so they do that in addition to their podcast that they do. So we're going to have them on on Friday and we've got some other good episodes coming up. I've been, I've been good, Andy. I've actually been booking guests. So. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I'm gone next week, so. Oh, okay. So we're going to have to move some um, right. Yeah, I'm gone next week, no, and then um, completely forgot that, and then no. I'm gone the week after that. Yep. So, all right, so we'll have another live show for you in about three weeks. Well, we'll have one Friday, and yeah, then we're Friday. gonna have one. What in, are we doing Friday? Weeks. That's when we, we'll have Brandon, possibly Brandon, oh, oh, yeah, from, yeah. from Game. You, you just Game. said it like thirty seconds ago. Yeah, you know, don't worry about it. I don't listen to me either a lot of times, so nah. it's all good. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's who will be here Friday. And now I need to go reschedule our ones for next week. Okay, luckily I only have one scheduled so far. So 
Yeah, I can figure that out. Not a problem. Anyway, that's it for now. Yeah, three shows in a row. Today, tomorrow, which tomorrow is what, Jay? You want to talk about well, that real quick? Is, uh, tomorrow is not going to be a show on a stream show. We've got It's a webinar that we're doing for the people who have downloaded our, our publisher list. So it's not going to be live. You know, you can, and I wish I could tell you, you know, I'll post the link in chat, but unfortunately it's like one of those giant, you know, Zoom addresses. But if you, if you so, get the publisher list, you're going to get the email, right? Well, you'll get, yeah, you'll get the next one. You won't get the one for this week. Okay. Um, so yeah, but if you, if you download the, um, if you download the publisher list, you will get invited to the next one that we're doing. Um, but I just posted the link in in chat, so that should propagate across you know Mixer and, and YouTube, Facebook, Twitch. Facebook. Instead of putting the link and put HTTPS and then put like a little smirky face. Oh, uh, wonderful. <laughs> okay, so if you're Facebook, okay. you may not have gotten that link, or you can figure it out from the emoji <laughs> translations. Yeah. Okay, so also make sure and catch all of our shows on Anchor.fm slash Indie Game Business. Yes. Uh, what else is there? I think that's it. Follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Indie. Bam! Plug. And, I waited now, an hour and a half for that. No. <laughs> Alex, Alex, I mean, do you, do you all have a Twitch page? Do y'all do, do streaming? Uh, game? We don't really stream. Yeah, we do have a Twitch page, but we don't really stream yet. Okay. Something we might do, but yeah. No. Just put the Jägermeister closer to the camera. Yeah. Next Everyone time. can well, relate. That's the empty one. Oh. I, I notice when I'm watching, when I look at the actual stream, Indy's got it cropped out, so you can't actually see these. Not right now, yeah. Congratulations, Alex. I just outed you right there. On, hey, it's so good. Word. No, you can see <laughs> it when it goes to his. The Jägermeister model. All, right. All right. Thank you much. Yeah, and, thanks, Alex. You know, Feel free well, to join you us, you know, us and Alex on Discord. It's discord.gg slash Indie Game Business. Indie Game Business. Just search Indie Game Business. You will see all the things. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Cheers.